everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. For this one, we're talking about Intel's Xeon CPU recall, the upcoming 7 nanometer XE GPU that Intel's working on. Uh, we have Intel plagued by speculative execution vulnerabilities. There's a lot of Intel stuff this week, but to be fair, it's been AMD nonstop. And on the AMD and NVIDIA side, AMD joining the scaling, uh, integer scaling party, and NVIDIA is in the news for being compatible with the new CryEngine ray tracing benchmark, which also works with AMD and older non-RTX NVIDIA cards. Before that, this video is brought to you by Linode Cloud Computing. We've trusted Linode as our web host since 2012 and recommend it for excellent technical and customer support, reliable uptime, and a clean interface. Aside from cloud hosting, Linode.com recently added GPU hosting plans for machine learning and neural net use, built with RTX 6000 GPUs and 10 gigabit per second network speeds. They're also starting to deploy Epic CPUs in their servers. Sign up for Linode.com Cloud Computing with code GNEXUS20 for a $20 credit or click the link in the description below to visit Linode.com slash GamersNexus. First, a quick note for those of you who missed the stream. First of all, the stream recap is, is should be online by now. We filmed a separate recap after our AMD Extreme Overclocking live stream. The live stream archive, when those upload, they upload about the last two hours or so and a chunk, and then the rest of it processes it later. So if you only saw the last hour of it out of context and thought it was sort of weird that we were only doing super chats, that's what we do at the end of the stream, then the rest of it is now processed. So if you do want to go back and watch the live overclocking, what we did was the first 40 minutes or so of that stream was just nonstop benching of the stock 3950X, and all we did was cold scale. So we brought it down from 84 degrees above zero down to about ni minus 90 degrees. And that allowed us to see how does the frequency respond to the different temperature thresholds for T-dye. And with that data, even though we were using liquid nitrogen as a tool, we were still testing in increments of about five degrees when we were above zero, which allows you to see how much does your cooler choice really matter. So if you want to see it live, that full archive is now up. It's the complete thing. The first 40 minutes or so is that stuff. And then the, maybe the middle two hours or so is actual overclocking. And then the last part of it is going to be all of the super chats that we read through. And also, if you want a shorter version of that, like 20 minutes or less, there's a recap that we filmed. OK. Uh, oh, and just to get the, the big numbers out there, it was 5.3 gigahertz, what we held, 1.7 volts or so. And then we did 4.9 gigahertz at an impressive 1.394 volts. So that 3950X we got for once, we actually got a really good sample. And historically, that's not really been true for us. We typically get, get garbage tier samples. So pretty cool to see. 4.9 at 1.394 is really good. It did require minus 50 degrees to hold that. But that's not completely crazy. It's, it's a little crazy, but it's not completely crazy. Uh, first up, Intel's upcoming 7 nanometer XE GPU, codenamed, going to embarrass myself here for the, the Italian speakers in our audience. I'm going to go with. Ponte Vecchio. Uh, so reports earlier this week have pegged, this is named after a, a bridge, reports earlier this week pegged Intel's first 7 nanometer XE GPU that the company has been working on diligently. It stole a lot of top ranking people from various companies like Nvidia's Tom Peterson, for example, now at, at uh, Intel from Nvidia previously. And the reports have indicated that the code name for the GPU is after the bridge in Florence, Italy. And the code name ostensibly signifies the importance of the emerging CXL, or Compute Express Link, interconnect that we've been covering for a couple of weeks now in our hardware news segments. This 7 nanometer GPU from Intel is supposed to make use of CXL as well. Uh, Ponte Vecchio will not be a gaming card. It will be very far from a gaming card from what we understand today. And it looks like it's supposed to be Intel's first foray into discrete graphics as a solution more aimed at exascale computing. This shouldn't really be too surprising. Intel typically goes after the money markets first, and that's going to be one of them. This should be used in the upcoming Project Aurora. Intel is rumored to be revealing more information about what Project Aurora actually is doing on November 17th. So we'll have to wait and see exactly what that project encompasses. That's also around when the it's around when Stadia, it's two days before Stadia goes live. It should be the 19th, I think, for that one. So we'll be, we'll be busy for that week for news. Uh, early reports suggest that Project Aurora could sport up to six Ponte Vecchio GPUs and two 7 nanometer Sapphire Rapids uh, Xeon chips. And Intel will also debut a new API initiative that will be known as One API. 
supposed to unify the CPU and the GPU. So like always, when you have a lot of standards, what you need to do is invent a new standard to unify all those standards. So now when you used to have 11 standards, you could have 12. This actually, it's, it's a little bit better than that, but we'll see how it does uh, as things develop. Next up, an Intel CPU recall. Earlier this week, Intel issued a recall for the boxed Xeon 2247G, a Coffee Lake-based processor series. The quad-core Xeon ships with Intel's stock DHA-A heatsink, and according to Intel, it isn't capable of meeting the chip's cooling requirements. The Xeon 2247-G carries an 83-watt TDP, and according to Anantec, Intel has shipped this specific cooler with chips rated at 84 watts since 2013. Intel is currently recommending trading the boxed version for a tray version instead with third-party coolant. As an aside, you can check out our deep dive on TDP ratings for some additional reading if you prefer. There's an article on the site about that now, or the video if you like that version. The, uh, that one focuses on AMD, but we should probably talk about Intel sometime soon too, especially since they're starting to launch stuff again. Next up, Corsair will sell you three fans for the price of only one mid-range CPU. Corsair's latest RGB fans carry 34 addressable RGB LEDs, a whole lot of them for a fan, and a price tag equivalent to an entry-level to mid-range CPU. Uh, if you buy, for example, an R5 2000 series, assuming users plan to buy more than one fan, it gets expensive fast. Corsair announced its IQ QL PWM fans earlier this week, and aside from the obvious RGB embellishments, the fans aren't especially noteworthy. They, they really aren't. But Corsair is offering the new line of fans in both 120 and 140 millimeter variants. Corsair's previous fans, similar to this design, like the LL series, are not particularly high static pressure or high performing, but they are filled with RGB LEDs. And that's a big market, to be fair to Corsair. The 120 140 variants feature vibration dampeners, uh, PWM control. Corsair says that it will offer the fans individually or in three packs. Prices start at $45 for the 120, $50 for the 140. A three pack will set you back for $140 uh, or 120 for one, one, uh, 140 millimeters and 120 millimeters, respectively. Next up is CryEngine, back in the news, and CryTech. If you'd forgotten CryTech exists, you're not alone. So did probably the employees who weren't paid by CryTech for six months when they worked there. That was an ugly time for Crytek. But presumably they're still alive and somehow still in business. Crytek is now offering a new hardware agnostic benchmark for ray tracing. It will work on AMD and NVIDIA and should work on older NVIDIA cards without RTX as well, if you're curious about performance for that. This benchmark will be known as Neon Noir. The benchmark was actually shown off back in March. You may remember discussion about it, especially when Crytek made sort of a big deal about the AMD hardware running this ray tracing benchmark, but it is now widely available via the Crytek Marketplace. The new tool should make it easier for developers to explore ray tracing implementation without having to worry about baked in hardware like RTX scores uh, or specific API requirements. According to Crytek, Neon Noir was, quote, developed on a bespoke version of CryEngine 5.5 and the experimental ray tracing feature based on CryEngine's total illumination used to create the demo is both API and hardware agnostic, enabling ray tracing to run on most mainstream contemporary AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. The feature will ship in CryEngine in 2020, optimized to take advantage of performance enhancements delivered by the latest generation of graphics cards from all manufacturers and supported APIs like Vulkan and DX12. Fun fact on Crytek and CryEngine, for those of you who didn't used to watch our coverage from years and years ago, we used to do a lot of interviews, basically wrote the book on early Star Citizen development. And there is a, I don't know if it's still active, but at least at one point there was a Crytek lawsuit against Cloud Imperium Games for rebranding CryEngine as Star Engine. And we are cited in that lawsuit. That's a, that's a fun fact for you. They actually, Crytek cited our interview with Chris Roberts on that one because he revealed it to us on camera and don't know how that went down, but pretty Pretty cool to be cited in that, I guess. Anyway, Intel still, pl at least someone comes out of this with uh, an interesting story, other than the lawyers. Intel still plagued by speculative execution vulnerabilities. Chip makers will continue to pay the price, it seems, for the unabated uh, migration towards endless performance while keeping securely firmly in their blind spots. Earlier this year, research disclosed a slew of security flaws. We also talked about a lot of them last year, Meltdown Inspector, for example, for a long time. But there were more still. 
Some of these were unique to Intel chips, some of them were wider spread. Some of the more unique ones were known collectively as MDS, and they were microarchitectural data sampling attacks. These included RIDL, Rogue In Flight Data Load, Zombie Load, and Fallout, not to be confused with the game, which is basically ransomware, if you wanted a canvas bag. However, there was a second variant of Zombie Load at the time of disclosure that was kept under wraps due to Intel not having a patch ready. Meet Zombie Load V2, yet another vulnerability that preys upon the speculative execution function in Intel CPUs. For its part, Zombie Load V2 appears to operate in a similar way to the original Zombie Load, but the key difference is that V2 affects newer chips with existing in silicon mitigations. This means that Intel's newest line of Cascade Lake X chips, the ones coming out shortly, uh, previous and Cascade Lake, previously thought to be safe, are actually at risk. And additionally, Zombie Load V2 leverages the TSX Asynchronous Abort, or TAA, operation to leak data on what the CPU is processing. The TSX instruction set extension has been available in entry-level Intel CPU since Haswell 2013 and affects every chip since then. According to the researcher's white paper, the vulnerability was verified with both an i9-9900K and a Xeon Gold 5218, both recent chips. Also, researchers discovered a problem with Intel's patches for other MDS flaws. It appears the problem lies within the VERW instruction set, which the research team claims is, quote, incomplete and can be circumvented. Intel downplayed the issue, explaining to ZDNet that the VERW instruction set, as well as other mitigations for MDS, were meant to reduce the attack surface rather than be a complete solution. Now, Intel also stated that it will make microcode for Zombie Load V2 available via its website, and as, as has been the case always, but especially in the last two years, it's a good idea to keep your systems up to date. That includes Windows, the BIOS or microcode updates, and drivers, especially. There was an NVIDIA update last week for a, a number of vulnerabilities in its own drivers that you should probably download if you have an NVIDIA card as well. A lot of the exploits that have been talked about the last few years don't necessarily affect consumers directly on your own PC. It might affect something like data center, or it might affect you if you're more worried about someone having local access to your system being able to execute these things, like a small business, data center again, stuff like that. That said, you should still download the security updates because not everything requires local access. Most, most of it really doesn't. So, uh, although the worst stuff does. Backblaze, hard drive failure stats for 2019 released Backblaze has released its most recent hard drive report. It does this quarterly, and their new report for Q3 data is out, although it's a bit shorter than we typically get from Backblaze because they're running some data integrity checks, and Backblaze is only presenting annualized lifetime failure rates this time. The latest report accounts for hard drives installed as of September 2019 and sees Backblaze adding 4,403 hard drives to its report. The Backblaze report is a, showing a slight increase in AFR, or annualized failure rate, going up to 1.73% compared to the previous 1.70% in quarter two. The Seagate 4TB ST4000 DM000 still leads the pack in AFR at 2.67%, but is down slightly from its previous rate of 2.72%. This is also one of the most deployed drives in use, so Backblaze notes that its figures may uh, reflect that. Alternatively, the HGST 12TB I shouldn't read this name, but it's HUH721212 ALN604, remains one of Backblaze's most reliable drives with an AFR of 0.47%, although that value represents a slight increase over the last quarter, 0.37%. Finally, AMD joins the integer scaling party. We already know that NVIDIA and Intel are working towards integer scaling inclusion for, their, uh, for implementations in their driver sets which meant it was only a matter of time before AMD joined the fray with its own. We actually reported on this back when NVIDIA pushed its integer scaling updates and basically said, AMD, it's your turn. Well, they've answered. So now, recent Linux drivers are referencing the feature with the most recent patch stating, quote, we want to guarantee integer ratio scaling for all scaling modes. AMD could possibly add integer scaling support with its yearly adrenaline update, its adrenaline driver update which rolled out in December of last year, and they should be pushing another one sometime soon. That'll be it for the news for this week. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly or pick up some cool and useful merch like our toolkits and mod mats, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time. <laughs>